Now, rumor has it that the person who sits at the end of the table can be heard but cannot be seen. <laughs> it's not a problem for me, but if it's a problem for you, I'm happy to stand up. No, it's fine. Do you want me to stand up? All right, then. Only if you want to. <laughs> That's fine. Of course, I, I should also say thank you to the organizing committee and Carl Jacobs in particular for inviting me here today. Um, I feel deeply honored and it's a great pleasure to present a fragment of my work. It's not a great confession, it's probably not even a great work, but all the same to, uh, to share some of my ideas with you and, uh, and to be here in the, in the presence of such eminent people. So thank you very much. As one of the most autobiographical psychoanalytic theorists of guilt, punishment, and confession, Theodore Reich rarely let an opportunity go by to recall and disclose those moments, and if we are to believe him, there were quite a few of them, when his beloved Sigmund Freud would discipline, would discipline his foolishness with the solid rod of paternal wisdom. Whereas many an aspiring pupil would no doubt wish to share primarily those achievements that had attracted the master's compliments, Reich consistently relished the occasions when Freud had once again expressed his profound dissatisfaction <laughs> with one or the other aspect of his followers' personal and professional course of action. In the introduction to the publication, of his letters from Freud at the end of the search within, Reich conceded that for obvious reasons, he had removed sections from the correspondence in which personal details of patients and fellow psychoanalysts were being discussed. Yet he stated that he had, quote, considered it inappropriate to omit Freud's critical comments, unquote because, he said, they had been formulated, quote, with such obvious benevolence and in such a form that they almost never, almost never, hurt my feelings, unquote. <laughs> For Reich, it may have seemed nothing more than a sign of love then when the master gave free rein to his merciless criticism. And Reich generally found it easier to accept Freud's scornful disapproval than his heartfelt sympathy. He found it easier to find that, uh, he found it easier to accept Freud's disapproval more than his appreciation and, as we know, his financial support. On New Year's Day, 1914, Freud wrote to Reich, quote, perhaps you have to conquer in yourself a streak of masochistic guilt, which sometimes, dear Reich, compels you to spoil favorable opportunities, unquote. It's a letter Freud wrote notably after his protege had managed to jeopardize the job that he himself, Freud, had secured for him. We do not know what, if anything, Reich replied. Yet we do know that he definitely did not wallow in complacent self-pity, but that he rapidly became the most prolific author in the psychoanalytic arena at the time, publishing a staggering 35 papers in 1914-1915. 35 papers. If you bear in mind that this was the beginning of the First World War and that Reich was about to be drafted into the army, um, that's not bad, that's not bad, 35 papers. Freud commented, quote, I know, Reich, that once again you are successfully engaged in spoiling for yourself as many opportunities as possible, unquote. <laughs> the irony of the remark, I think, should not be missed here. For if Reich may have been successful in failing to take advantage of many a professional opportunity, it was also, it seems, precisely by virtue of these missed opportunities that he somehow managed to become a hugely successful professional psychoanalyst. <laughs>
Now, it would be relatively easy to write the intellectual biography of Theodore Reich as a story of personal tragedy, of institutional victimization, and of professional rejection. Something which seems to have repeated itself along the axis of an unresolved guilt complex. What I'll try to present to you is an attempt at telling a different story, or at least an attempt at telling a story that is more nuanced, more complex, more complicated, and that on account of my uh, quite extensive research in, in the archives, which, which isn't finished, that I think is actually more accurate as to the um, intellectual biography of Theodore Reich. Now, many of the key events in Reich's life here are sufficiently well known and have already been rehearsed on a number of occasions here today. Um, and some of them are, of course, also narrated in his own confessional volumes. So I will restrict myself to a brief summary. But I will nonetheless attempt um, on a number of occasions to add some details based on, on some archival research, uh, such as, as the research I'm currently doing in uh, the archives of the Dutch Psychotic <coughs> Society. Um, and that work is relatively well known, uh, sorry, um, relatively unknown to an English sp uh, speaking audience because most of the documents are actually in Dutch. In June, um, and, and I think Mort Israel reminded us of this this morning, in June 1906, one of the two doctors attending to his father's sickbed instructed the 18 year old Theodore to go and obtain a life saving medicine from the nearest drugstore. Yet when Theodore arrived back at the house, his father had already died. What followed, as Reich says in the fragment of a great confession, was a question that was as tormenting as it was unanswerable. Quote, could I have saved my father's life if I had run more quickly? Unquote. In February 1925, at a time when Reich was well established as a practicing psychoanalyst in Vienna, the city's legal authorities um, no doubt informed by the ever-belligerent Wilhelm Stekel, the city's legal authorities charged Reich with quackery. This actually precedes the whole discussion of lay analysis. They charged him with the illegal practice of medicine on the grounds of a lack of professional qualifications. That is to say, they doubted his analytic training. And they prevented him from seeing patients an injunction which would have implied for Theodore Reich at the time a substantial loss of earnings. Reich writes about this uh, very extensively in a, in a letter to his former analyst Carl Abraham dated 11 April 1925. Now as we know, thanks to Freud's support, Reich continued to practice. Yet one year later, and this is the story that we all know, young, one year later, an American patient of Reich's called Newton Murphy who had notably been referred to, to Reich by Freud himself, decided to expose his psychoanalyst as a charlatan. So the, the whole um, Reich affair uh, concerning lay analysis was actually triggered by one of Reich's own patients, Newton Murphy, who was an, an, an American. Um, he exposed his psychoanalyst as a charlatan and decided to initiate legal proceedings against him, which prompted Freud to compose the celebrated defense of his pupil in the question of lay analysis. A lengthy exposition, as you all know, of the virtues of a non-medical approach to psycholytic treatment that triggered an equally extensive discussion in the media and the professional literature, including in the New York Times, um, and eventually led to all charges against Reich being dropped. Now, it, it's always interested me that, that Reich was not the only lay analyst uh, practicing in Vienna at the time. Hmm? Uh, the most prominent amongst them was actually Freud's own daughter, Anna Freud. He, he wasn't trained as a medical doctor. Um, but somehow, the man with the guilt complex... Uh, and it becomes more ironic, who had recently published a series of lectures on the compulsion to confess and the need for punishment, somehow, quote-unquote, succeeded in attracting the blow. Mm. And just before the Reich affair, Reich published a series of lectures called uh, Geständnis, Zwang und uh, Strafbedürfnis, the compulsion to confess and the need for punishment, which subsequently fed into... Um, um, a, a series of other volumes published in English. I mean, the Reich bibliography is very difficult to manage because Reich um, often 
uh, used chapters, uh, translated chapters of, of his older works in, in, in his uh, English volumes. Now, remarkably, Reich himself rarely reflected upon the circumstances and the consequences of the accusation, which again has always somehow surprised me. And even less, it seems, upon the unwavering support he had received from Freud. And on those few occasions when Reich did refer to the question of lay analysis and Freud's support, he tended to invoke the expository value of the book as a theoretical and clinical précis of psychoanalysis rather than its significance for his own personal and professional destiny. And, of course, uh, for that of generations of su subsequent practicing psychoanalysts. In From 30 Years with Freud, Reich wondered, quote, what part of the contents of the question of lay analysis will be considered most significant after 20 or 50 years? And he continued, I think it is the penetrating discussion of the problem, and, sorry, um, is it the penetrating discussion of the problem and the elucidation of Freud's point of view? Not at all, he says. The significance of the book will lie rather in this fact, that the essence of analysis is here represented with an impressive clarity never before reached, unquote. It's a strange comment given uh, the matter that was actually uh, at stake. Now, less well known than the Reich affair of the mid-1920s are the professional difficulties he experienced in the Netherlands some 10 years later. And that's what I want to focus on a little bit, partly because that's what I'm working on at the moment, and also because it's relatively unknown in the English-speaking world. In the autumn of 1933, Reich fled the increasingly anti-Semitic climate in Berlin, where he had been teaching and practicing almost uninterruptedly for five years. And he emigrated with wife and son, his first wife, that is, Ella, and son, uh, Arthur, to the Netherlands. Although in October 1930, Reich had delivered a speech at the opening ceremony of the Dutch Institute for Psychoanalysis, which was the first official psycholytic training program in the Netherlands, the reception he received from the Dutch psychoanalysts when arriving in The Hague was extraordinarily icy. Reflecting upon the embarrassing situation some 60 years later, the Dutch psychoanalyst Han Groen Prakken writes, quote, today, this is 1993, 60 years later, he sa uh, she says, uh, today we cannot help feeling ashamed of the hostility, the pettiness, and the egoism which the refuse refugees, because apart from Reich, um, there were three other people who had emigrated from Berlin to um, to the Netherlands, including Karl Landauer. So she says, the egoism with which the refugees um, encountered in Holland, unquote. So this is actually a, a pretty shameful uh, part of, of the history of the Dutch psychoanalytic movement. Now, at the time, Dutch law prohibited foreigners from practicing medicine. And despite Freud's insistence on the acceptability of lay analysis, the Dutch psychoanalytic society the Nederlandse Vereniging voor Psychoanalyse, dictated that non-medical doctors could not become full members. So this is prior to the whole Reich affair at the New York Psychiatric Institute, right? With a PhD in psychology, Reich was therefore de facto excluded from practicing psychoanalysis in the Netherlands, even if he had managed to secure Dutch citizenship. When the president of the society an eminent Dutch psychoanalyst by the name of Johan van Ophuizen tried to intervene on behalf of the newly arrived colleagues, another leading figure in the society, uh, I.E. Westermann Holstein, who had notably been in analysis with Reich, another leading figure managed to convince the society's members to maintain their standards, which eventually led to van Ophuizen's resignation. Van Ophuizen subsequently created a new, less rigidly medical psychotic society, which Reich was invited to join, yet which effectively placed him outside the professional body of the IPA, the International Psychotic Association. So once again, we see here how one of uh, Reich's own analysands 
is, is actually acting against him. Uh, so it was Newton Murphy in, in, in the mid-1920s. Here it's Westermann Holstein who takes the lead in uh, facilitating his exclusion from the um, official Dutch society. Now, Ernest Jones, who was the then president of the IPA, was deeply concerned about the Dutch situation. And there's, there's a lot of uh, letters going backwards and forwards uh, in the Dutch archives, and insisted on a meeting with Westermann Holstein. Frustrated and disappointed about what he perceived to be Jones's lackluster endorsement of the events, yet no less determined to justify his actions, Westermann Holstein went on to defend himself in a long letter to Jones. I quote, the Dutch have a certain liberality of mind, and you'll see in a minute how ironic this is. He says, the Dutch have a certain liberality of mind, which makes them much more tolerant against opinions which they reject. <laughs> furthermore, furthermore, dear Jones, he says, as among the leading analysts of Holland, there is not a single Jew. We have until now been liberated from this animosity existing in other countries, <laughs> where anti-Semitic feelings of the opponents counterbalanced by a Jewish sticking together of some analysts have always troubled the scientific and social situation." Unquote. <laughs> so what we see here is that the whole discussion of lay analysis and the principles of psychoanalytic training is overshadowed by a much more fundamental concern of the preservation of national values. Right? And I think that this is something that, that is often forgotten when the history of lay analysis is discussed. It's not just about analytic training or the value of, of someone's degrees. It's about the preservation of national values and the associated threat that certain analysts, uh, of all people, perceived as coming from uh, the external uh, move of, of, of immigration. In other words, the professional exclusion that Reich suffered at the hands of the Dutch psychoanalysts, first and foremost amongst them his own former patient, was not merely the result of a set of rigid beliefs about the medical scientific basis of psycholytic practice and analytic training, but also, and perhaps primarily, an effect of Dutch nationalistic attitudes and, I think, also an unconscious anxiety vis-a-vis -vis Jewish intruders. The latter issue is particularly ironic, of course, given the fact that Reich and his colleagues exchanged the rising nationalist anti-Semitic politics in Germany for the Dutch liberality of mind, only to encounter a pervasive nationalism and lingering anti-Semitism amongst their own kind. Never shy of sarcastic wit, Reich told Westermann Holstein in a, in a letter he wrote in Dutch, um, stop being a Hollander and concentrate on being an analyst. <laughs> it is hoog tijd dat je stopt met Hollander te zijn en dat je een analyticus uh, wordt, he wrote. Gradually, the immigrants gained some form of acceptance, yet the relationship between them and the Dutch institutions remained very strained. On the 17th of February, 1936, Reich wrote in German to the presidents of both cyclic societies in the Netherlands, so both to Westermann Holstein and to Van Ophuysen. Now, I'll read you an extract uh, from this letter, again, because uh, it's not very well known. Quote, this is Reich. Two and a quarter years ago, I came to the Netherlands, and without any support from anyone, and without anyone offering me any help, I continued my analytic activities." Unquote. Reich goes on to mention that he was doing cyclic work at the time with three patients, but that he did not have any prospects of getting more referrals. He emphasized that he wasn't particularly interested in the psychotherapeutic side of psychoanalysis, but more in psycholytic training, educational issues, applied psychoanalysis, and the general psychological significance of psychoanalysis, which goes back a, a, a long time, uh, already to the 1920s, 
Um, and the letter continues, quote, in these areas, I occupy, dare I say, one of the most important, if not the most important place in the analytic movement, unquote. Um, so this, 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 despite your um, comment that Reich was a very modest man, in, 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 in my research, he, he often comes across, at least in his letters, to um, representatives of the official cyclic establishment uh, as, as not all that modest. Um, as, well, when, when you read this, uh, you, can, you can regard it actually as arrogance, uh, whereas uh, someone else may, may regard it as unconcealed self-indulgence. Right? Fact of the matter is here that Reich's oft noted, and you mention it, modest and unassuming character did not shine through here, and that his intellectual, quote-unquote, pretentiousness which had already been noted and of course duly reprimanded by Freud during the early years of their acquaintance did not actually help him in persuading the Dutch psychoanalysts to give him full access to their professional ranks. What emerges from Reich's communications and his letters with the Dutch Cyclitic Society is perhaps not just a lack of diplomacy. Provoked by a narcissistic wound sustained by some kind of excessive self-esteem, but also a disguised form of social masochism, inspired by guilt feelings and pursued with a view to, and I quote from masochism in modern man, pursued with a view to, quote, to be appreciated and esteemed after having been disgraced and degraded, unquote. What is starting to emerge here, therefore, I think, is that Reich's personal and professional story is not just characterized by defeat, rejection, <coughs> victimization, but by a much more complex dynamic, I mentioned it earlier on, a much more complex dynamic in which ambitiousness attracts rejection and rejection becomes the basis for success. And this mental economy was of course expertly captured by Reich himself in uh, the book I just mentioned, In Masochism in Modern Man which is effectively, uh, and I think Otto mentioned this, or perhaps it was uh, Harold this morning, which is effectively the English translation of a German book entitled Aus Leiden Freuden, which Reich completed during the period in the Netherlands, and which he ardently wished but failed to present to Freud before his death. He may have asked himself, could I have realized my desire if I had written more quickly? Explaining the nature of social masochism, Reich posited in Masochism in Modern Man, quote, a key characteristic of social masochism is the negative ambition. The negative ambition is a key feature of the social masochistic type. This kind of defiant reaction, which analysts have not yet, yet discovered, demonstrates a peculiar brand of vindictive sabotage directed less against oneself than against others. The negative ambition, he continues, is a grim reversal of the normal urge in such a way that every opportunity is missed. Sounds like what Freud was writing to him back in 1914. In such a way that every opportunity is missed. Every possibility of success is turned into a failure. Every competition is avoided. Unconsciously, the masochistic character steps aside for every rival, lets others, have, lets others have the middle of the road and enjoys their successes and achievements. The masochistic type is so excellent a loser that it is to be expected that he is not a good loser at all. I love that right quote. It's fantastic. <laughs> right? Uh, he is so excellent a loser that it is to be expected that he is not a good loser at all, unquote. Apart from the fact that Reich's words here involuntarily remind us of the comments made by Freud in his early letters to his pupil, we also recognize in this excellent loser an image of the man who managed to turn every threat into an opportunity, who shied away from success, hence the idea of his modesty perhaps, who shied away from success if it hadn't been reached through some form of victimization, who outperformed himself by virtue of failure, who reaches victory through defeat. 
With the spread of the Nazi persecution, again, this story is well known, with the spread of the Nazi persecution across Western Europe, Reich left the Netherlands in 1937. Arriving, as he uh, stated to Blumer Sverdlov in uh, an interview from the early 1960s, arriving in New York City via Prague, Vienna, Naples, and Cairo with his heavily pregnant second wife, um, a young daughter, no friends, and eight dollars in his pocket. The story is that, that he had left all his money in a, in a Viennese bank um, rather than transferring it to the Netherlands, and when the Nazis took power, they confiscated all his money. So he, uh, and he was never able to make much money in, in, in the Netherlands because he didn't have many patients. In New York, um, and again, that's why the Dutch adventure is important, right? Um, because we, t we, we, we tend to think that Reich's troubles with the New York psycholytics signaled um, a starting point of um, his trouble with the official psycholytic institution, but it's not the case, right? In New York, his Dutch adventure, uh, which was somehow already a repetition of the events during the mid-1920s, again repeated itself. In the search within, Reich recalled, quote, after I realized that I could no longer stay in Holland without the risk of becoming a prisoner of the Nazis who were threatening to invade that country, I immigrated to the United States. Most members of the New York Psychologic Society treated me condescendingly and I was strongly admonished against practicing or rather for forbidden to practice psychoanalysis. I complained about this when I wrote to Freud. I asked him if he, Freud, could suggest some way in which I might continue my work, unquote. Never afraid of criticizing his protege, Freud wrote back from London on the 3rd of July, 1938. And he said, dear Reich, what ill wind has blown you, just you, to America? <laughs> <laughs> you must have known, supreme irony, you must have known how amiably and favorably lay analysts would be perceived there <laughs> by our American colleagues for whom, as you knew, psychoanalysis is nothing more than one of the handmaidens of psychiatry. Whenever I think of you, dear Reich, a great deal of sympathy but profound annoyance fight within me." <laughs> Unquote. Um, on Reich's request, Freud included um, a brief letter of recommendation to his missive, which Reich uh, tried to use in order to gain support, including from Anna Freud, by the way. Um, so he wrote back to Anna Freud. There's some interesting documents in the Library of Congress, a, a short correspondence between Reich and Anna Freud. So he asked Anna whether she wanted to support him too. She categorically refused. Um, but despite Freud's letter of recommendation, uh, Reich, as we know, did not gain acceptance in the New York Psychedelic Society. Um, and as Reich uh, stated to Blumer Sverdlov, again in, in, in the interview of the early 1960s, Lawrence Kuby um, even offered him $200 a month as a stipend on condition that he wouldn't see any patients and concentrate all his psychedelic activities in the areas of teaching and writing. They were happy to make him into an honorary member of the New York Psychologic, yet as such, he would only be allowed to give the odd lecture there and under no circumstances whatsoever be permitted to see patients. But as, as we know from, from uh, um, your work, uh, he saw patients anyway because they actually came to see him uh, for analysis. Defiant as ever, Reich refused to comply. And he drew on his growing minor celebrity status uh, and his own dogged determination to establish himself as a practitioner to make a living and to uh, reestablish himself in the US. In another confessional volume, uh, not as well known as uh, the ones that have already been mentioned, in another confessional volume called The Secret Self from 1953, Reich recalled the difficulties he experienced during the first months after his arrival in the, in the US. The chapter is called Lullaby for Miriam, which is a tribute to um, his second daughter. 
This is right. Miriam was born on the 23rd of July, 1938, in the Lenox Hospital in New York City, six weeks after our landing in New York. The first months after Miriam's birth were hard. It seemed that all my bad presentiments would become reality, and I often felt discouraged. After a while, however, I found out that I wasn't as unknown here as I thought. I found out that I actually could start an analytic practice. I began to build a new existence, starting from scratch. And contrary to all pessimism, I discovered unknown resources in myself. A hidden energy came to the surface." Unquote. Now, once again, we notice here how Reich's, well, what shall we call it, Reich's humiliation Reich's repeated exclusion, because it already happened in the Netherlands, at the hands of psycholytic officialdom, somehow endowed him with a newfound moral courage and a new source of inspiration. We know that it would take him until 1948 to establish the National Psychological Association for Psychoanalysis, that NPAP, admitting medical as well as non-medical candidates for analytic training, and another 12 years to witness the opening of the Theodore Reich Mental Hygiene Clinic. But the years following Reich's rejection from the New York Scientific Society can easily be regarded as his most productive, most creative, and most successful. His books, which seem to succeed one another faster than an average reader could actually digest them, <laughs> were often announced with great publicity in the New York Times. I haven't come across any other analyst who gets uh, almost a, a half-spread page in the New York Times announcing his new book. Um, so he was recognized as a public intellectual, lectured at Carnegie Hall, at the William Allison White Institute, at Adelphi University, spent many of his summers um, as a consultant psychoanalyst at the Highland Hospital in Asheville, North Carolina maintained a flourishing practice in Manhattan and was widely regarded as one of the country's leading psychoanalysts. So more than ever before, it seems, Reich succeeded. He succeeded in turning professional exclusion into personal recognition and social success. And in light of what I argued earlier regarding the negative ambition that underpins the mental economy of social mas masochism and the way in which, at least according to Reich, it may constitute a new motive for gaining strength from the prospective rehabilitation, one may actually wonder, and I have wondered, what would have happened to Reich had he been accepted by the New York Cyclitic? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps he wouldn't have written all the books he had written. Huh? Perhaps he would have been ruined, it's, it's Reich's own for, uh, formula, ruined by success. But whatever may have been suggested in the past here concerning Reich's remarkable resilience in the wake of adversity, I wish to propose the idea that it may not have been despite, but by virtue sometimes, of his status as a cyclic pariah that he found a new raison d'être. Redeemed by failure, emboldened by marginalization, encouraged by disempowerment. I mean, there are other examples I, I could give here. Um, something else that is um, relatively unknown, and I'm grateful to uh, Helen Michaels, who's the daughter of Benjamin Margolis, for providing me access to her archives. But uh, during the 1950s, Reich actually ab applied to the New York State uh, Department to, to be recognized as a psychologist. So on account of, of his psychology training, and his subsequent PhD in psychology, which was, of course, uh, on, on a cyclic study of, of uh, La Tentation de Saint-Antoine, um, he tried to gain uh, recognition. And, um, and there's endless documents, endless correspondence going backwards and forwards between Reich and, and, and uh, Vienna University, uh, and they weren't particularly helpful, uh, and if they were, they were rather slow. And, and then um, documents that were sent to the New York State uh, Department. So, uh, it, it's as if, you know, his newfound success with the NPAP and, 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 and his recognition by the New York Times um, was not enough, and, and, and he wanted something else, um, but, but when you read through the documents, uh, 
there is again a sense of arrogance and a sense of pretentiousness which I think wouldn't have made it easier for him to actually gain the recognition. Now, according to my research, he never got it, right? And, and as soon as he um, hears the news that, uh, well, because his training was what, 60 years ago and it was in Vienna and, and, uh, and there's problems with, with, with the, the um, um, uh, homologi homologization, the, the authorization, and etc. As soon as he hears that he doesn't get it, again he writes uh, to, um, to Benjamin Nelson that he has found a new source of inspiration. Right? Uh, and, and new courage, new moral courage has come to the fore. Um, and, and he conceives of the project of uh, his so-called um, biblical trilogy. It's, it's uh, three books from the 60s, which are, are not quoted very, very often. Uh, Mystery on the Mountain, I won't be able to, to remember all the titles, I think. Mystery on the Mountain um, and, and two others, right? Mm -hmm. So there you go. So it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's another example of, of, of how Reich... <laughs> Um, found, uh, found victory through defeat, in a sense, in his own work, or, or, or was always somehow rescued by failure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it might become a bit more controversial here, but when during the 1950s and 60s, Reich's own organization, the NPAP, increasingly hailed him as what the French called un maître à penser, uh, an intellectual master and a spiritual guide, Reich seemed to have been uh, increasingly adopting a, a, a more distant position. I think, Carl, you mentioned this morning that uh, despite the fact that he was the president, um, the, 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 it, it was actually run by a, a board of governors. So he, he seemed to adopt an increasingly more distant position. Uh, and sometimes in, in private letters, again to, to Benjamin Margolis and, and, Benj uh, and uh, Benjamin Nelson, um, expressed his disappointment with his own people expressing his doubts as to their psychological talents, refusing sometimes to make more than token appearances at scientific meetings, and often reluctantly accepting the honors associated with his position of president and director of the clinic. There was a 65th and a 70th birthday party with lots of pomp and circumstance, which prompted a letter, I won't uh, quote it to you at length, uh, in which he said, oh, yeah. Uh, I can't believe they're doing this to me. Uh, uh, this is, <laughs> uh, once again, I have to meet these people. Uh, very few of them are psychologically talented, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> right. Um, but partly as a result of that, actually, and it also, it always came to me as a surprise, as a result of it, he decided to donate uh, pictures and documents to the New York Psycholytic. Right? So one of the first archives that I visited, and um, the problem with doing research on Theodore Reich is that there is no central Theodore Reich archive. Yeah? So I find myself traveling to the Netherlands, to Vienna, to Stanford, to the Library of Congress. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's time consuming. But one of, one of, one of the first uh, archives that I visited was the New York Psycholytic. Uh, and I never thought I would visit the New York Psycholytic, right? Uh, um, at least not to find some documents by Theodore Reich, which he himself had donated. <laughs> but lo and behold, lo and behold, um, before his death, uh, um, before his death, uh, a letter was signed in which it was agreed that after his death, um, his pictures, and they're not particularly valuable uh, for all I could tell, but that his pictures and a number of his manuscripts would be archived at the New York Psycholytic. <laughs> right, there you go, you see. Yeah. You made him too successful. Precisely. How, however, uh, however. The man didn't like it. He didn't like it. Danny, so, Danny how, however, I, I just want to say that, that we are now start now, in 2010, starting a Theodore Reich archive. And uh, it... So there is, there is some evidence, well, I think there is substantial evidence that, uh, that Reich did not regard institutional success, including in the, or, in, the own, in the organization he himself had helped to create, and undisputed personal recognition as conducive to the production of cyclic work in the Freudian spirit of discovery. 
quite apart also from the principles of analytic training he established, and I'll talk a little bit about that if you have five, five minutes. Five, okay, I'll be quick. Quite apart from the principles of analytic training he established at the NPAP and continued to support until the end of his life, Reich um, did not believe in the importance, it seems, of consolidating psychoanalysis as a respected theory, practice, and method. Neither within the psycholytic community, nor across the spectrum of mental health care, nor, for that matter, in the global social cultural realm. He seems to have wanted psychoanalysis, his own private practice, as well as the wider theoretical and clinical tradition, he seems to have wanted psychoanalysis to remain in a critical state, inchoate, subversive, intuitive, marginal, and potentially despised, of course. Now, Reich's own, quote-unquote, arrogant contestation of the established norms and his dissident pursuit of idiosyncratic approaches were, of course, reminiscent here, he believed, of the way in which Freud himself had never refrained from reinventing his own theory, reinventing it against the odds, at the risk of losing supporters, and with a critical eye for every attempt at turning it into a firmly established doctrine. In Jewish Wit, one of Reich's lesser known works, um, although I, you, you quoted it, Erica, uh, in, in Jewish Wit, one of Reich's lesser known works from the early 1960s, the aging psychoanalyst, he was 72 at the time, designated the Jews as, quote, the Schlemiel among the nations, unquote. Whereby he, de whereby he defined the Schlemiel as, quote, a masochistic character who has indeed all the earmarks of this ca characterological type, including the tendency of victory through defeat, the irresistible will to master a reluctant destiny. Perhaps they are sometimes ruined by success, but they are always then rescued by failure, unquote. Now, whether or not one agrees with this designation, I've tried to demonstrate that Reich himself should perhaps not just be remembered as the victim of the socio-legal establishment in Vienna 1925, and sometimes, I guess, of, you know, of his own patients here, um, Newton Murphy and um, uh, A.J. Westermann Holstein, but also, and more positively, uh, positively, as the schlemiel of psychoanalysis. <laughs> With the caveat that he himself may sometimes have been the architect of, of his own fate. Perhaps on account of an unresolved guilt complex, but definitely with a view to generating some of the most innovative, creative, and altogether inspiring contributions to psychoanalysis. Carl already mentioned it this morning. Um, in, in 1968, one year before Reich's death, Martin uh, Grotian conceded, quote, the writings of Sigmund Freud introduced me to psychoanalysis. The works of Theodore Reich showed me how to be an analyst. Freud gave me knowledge, Reich gave, sorry, Reich gave me courage, unquote. Now, I could end there, but um, I do realize that we, we're actually here also to discuss the legacies of Theodore Reich. So very briefly, um, I, will, I want to single out six, six points where I think that, that Reich's work is, is still of, of the utmost Im importance. The first point uh, has to do with analytic training um, and, and, and lay analysis. I think. The, the debate concerning lay analysis is, is largely resolved now, but the debate concerning what constitutes a proper analytic training is still very much on the agenda. And I can't speak for the US, but, but in Europe, there are extensive debates concerning um, whether uh, we need to uh, impose, and some countries already have it, a state regulation of, of psychoanalysis. In Britain, we have a body called the UKCP, the United Kingdom Council of, of Psychotherapy, which, which is a regulatory body that um, designates what they expect to see as part of, of analytic training. Um, so, so the discussion is still very much on, on the agenda. Now, um, Reich, uh, Reich did not write a comprehensive volume on analytic training. But in a sense, um, th th there are aspects of uh, what he believed to be important for becoming a psychoanalyst that pervade his entire work. And, and, and what I derive from, from reading Reich's work is that for him, um, in psychoanalysis, a certain type of formalization is necessary, 
Uh, like, he, he wasn't the Paul Feyerabend of, of psychoanalysis and, and, and was completely against method. So a certain type of formalization is necessary, but it's formalization without formality. Ditto, I, I, what I derived from my reading is that he advocated principles whereby he valued the importance of rigor, clinical rigor, academic rigor, theoretical rigor, but rigor without rigidity. And thirdly, I'd say that Reich, throughout his work, was not opposed to standards, but what he uh, favored was standards without standardization. Now, so that's, that's the first point, I would say, that, that remains very important um, as, as part of his legacy. Secondly, um, and it didn't help uh, with his recognition in the Netherlands and, and, and in, in, in the States, um, for, for Reich, Psychoanalysis is much more an art than a science. Right? Um, so, so Reich ha has very strong opinions about, well, you could say the professional status of psycholytic practice, but also about the ep epistemology, uh, and Anna used the word, the epistemology of psychoanalysis, the relationship between truth and knowledge. He did not believe in the, in the, in the scientific correspondence criterion of truth. That, uh, you know, an idea is true if it matches with an external reality. Uh, for him, and, and, and interesting parallels can be drawn here between Reich and the work of Lacan. Uh, for Reich, uh, truth is, is, is something that, that emerges um, in, in the fractures of knowledge, or is something that can never be completely captured by knowledge. And, and he always maintained the, the differential between the two. Now, of course, that fed in, that's the third point, that fed into the development of um, what I do think is um, a certain set of precepts, well, you could say standards, um, uh, for interpretation. Um, and I think Anna mentioned that, that there are two major contributions. I, I think there are actually more in, in Reich's work. Um, in Listening with the Third Ear, Reich devote, devotes a whole chapter to what he calls the courage not to understand which again uh, feeds into Lacan's famous principle, gardez-vous de comprendre, uh, guard yourself against understanding. So like Reich's perspective on psychoanalysis is, is here decisively non-intellectualist, like he doesn't believe that the more knowledge the psychoanalyst uses in his practice, the more he or she will be able to conduct the analysis productively. Um, if anything, and again, much like Lacan, Reich would say that the knowledge of the psychoanalyst is the symptom of his ignorance, <laughs> right? Um, hence the whole idea about intuition um, and, and listening with the third ear, which, which some have seen as, as mystical or spiritual, but, but I think you know, it, it, it's actually a, a very um, profound and fundamental alternative epistemology which has very little to do with, with, with mysticism or, or, or spirituality. Fourthly, um, Reich demonstrates that reverence, admir uh, admiration, you use the word devotion, Anna, uh, towards the, the masters does not exclude, should not stop anyone from innovating. And, and so, and I think it's a very important principle. Um, the history of the cyclic movement is, is characterized by hierarchies of leaders and followers. And, and, and quite often, the way in which the followers, in their admiration for the masters, have failed to innovate, I think, has resulted in, in a certain sclerotization of, of, of the analytic process. I mean, Reich demonstrated, and we, we've heard the example um, early on about the libido theory, that however much he loved Freud, it would never stop him from making essential contributions to the theory and, and, and the practice. Um, that was four, I think, five. Of course, the history of um, Reich's um, dealings with, with, with the establishment um, also uh, shows his extraordinary resilience against rejection. And, and I think this principle, victory through defeat or, 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 or um, rescued by failure, is, is incredibly important here, not just for Reich, but, but, but for the status of psychoanalysis in the 21st century. Um, I mean, at the moment, and I'm sure the same is true in the US, but at, at the moment, uh, psychoanalysis has to compete uh, with CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, but also in, 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 in many instances, 
has to prove its, its validity because of um, evidence-based practice, because of mental health care um, standards, and, and, and quite often that has led to psychoanalysts, at least in, in Europe, feeling marginalized without that marginalization resulting in the creative upsurge of energy that Reich here demonstrates. If anything, it has resulted in psychoanalysts closing the ranks and becoming more dogmatic, more doctrinal, which I think at the end of the day might potentially lead to their own destruction. I've often thought that if psychoanalysis is to die, it might be because of the psychoanalysts themselves. Right? If only they, they, they could learn something from the way in which Reich here, on account of his social masochism or whatever you want to call it, always consistently manages to um, rescue himself uh, through failure. And then finally, um, as we all know, uh, Reich's work is, is pervaded from the beginning to the end um, with a very strong, and this will bring me full circle, autobiographical component. And, and his autobiographical confession is, isn't, I mean, some people might see this as a self-absorbed, self-indulgent way of, of, of writing, but I think his, his confession um, is, is also, and perhaps primarily, about what he encounters in his practice as an analyst. Uh, to me, it reflects not just his personal struggle, it, it re reflects this ongoing um, conflict that he feels in himself when treating patients. And, and as far as that's concerned, I would say that, that Reich came up, and, and you find a similar idea in the work of Hans Lewald, um, Reich comes up with, with the idea that it's never really possible to be an analyst. Just as much it's never really possible to be an artist. The best one can do uh, ever is to try and become an analyst or to try and become an, an artist. Um, just as much as Freud said, you, you always have to uh, treat a, a patient as if it's the first patient you've ever treated. So what, 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 what Reich confesses to here is, is this struggle the difficulty of finding for and, and defining for himself a position that, uh, that would be identifiable but also somehow established. And I think the fact that he can't do it means that more than anyone else, Reich is, is, is probably uh, a tribute to what it means to work as an analyst, uh, to, to constantly reinvent one's own position. And, and I think th this is something that is also often forgotten in the history of the psychoanalytic movement, especially during the 1950s and 60s, which is all about standardization, formalization, and indeed rigidity. On, on that note, I will end and conclude the discussion. Thank you very much.